been a real shock to me. And then meeting Elie Wiesel and Kofi Annan in 2003, where they had the first conference on anti-Semitism at the United Nations. And he, uh, may he rest in peace, um, was among him and Natan Sharansky were the first to sort of support the idea of ISGAP. And uh, he was our honorary president uh, from 2003 till his passing just a short while ago. And in a sense, there is this blind spot, and the blind spot is complicated. Why is there a blind spot? And what, you know, and we will go into details, and you hear more week about why there's a blind spot. Um, and what we've tried to do in ISGAP and try to do is to bring high-caliber scholarship um, to some of the better universities in the world. So we're still, you know, we were at Yale for a while for five years. And now, as you know, we do programs at McGill, Harvard, Columbia. We've done work at Stanford and Fordham, at La Sapienza, where we've done wonderful work. And I believe and hope it will continue to, to grow and expand. Um, we've engaged the Vatican. We're at, uh, doing work at Tel Aviv University. We're in Kiev. And in, in, in November, we're going to the best university in Moscow, uh, if everything goes well. And I think what we're doing, what we're trying to do is to open the space to remove the blinders at the highest and most serious levels of scholarship, of rational thought. And, and I, think, I think what Katya said yesterday is very important. You know, how do you take this and reach students? And I think at one level, as Femi said, you have to know your audience and your students, and it's not easy. And I think it reminded me what you said, I was thinking last night what you said, and I remember Melanie Phillips, who was the editor of The Guardian, who became a crusader to fight for, against anti-Semitism and radicalism. She said in, the, in around 1990 in The Guardian that if you speak about racism in the United Kingdom, it's great dinner conversation. The liberals will speak about it all night, housing and jobs and, and segregation, and they'll speak about it and speak about it, they'll do nothing but it's great conversation. Nothing will happen but good conversation. And she said, the moment you talk about anti-Semitism, people look at their shoes and their silence. So it's a very difficult issue. And I think, so how to convey this to students, how to, how to feel secure in your space, in your department, in your classroom, among your colleagues. I mean, there's, I'm sure in this room, I know in this room, and among our scholars coming to visit, there are real serious stories. There are stories of uh, students being t fearful that they won't pass a class if they articulate certain views. Professors and scholars who articulate certain views lose their jobs <coughs> and will never be promoted uh, in, in a way that is they deserve. Um, so there's a lot of intimidation. And while we are in the sort of postmodern, I call it confusion, you know, one, and as a footnote, not even, we don't all have to agree with each other because one of the principles of ISGAP that we insist on is academic freedom. Freedom to discuss, to debate, to, to, to argue. But one of the things I learned here is that I would argue with somebody over lunch and they would give me two or three references to read. And I would go and read them, what they wanted me to read. And I would come back with five or six articles and they would actually read it. And they would come back with 10 articles. And we'd, we'd spend months and years in this, in this dining room arguing. But we'd both be learning a lot. And that's what scholarship has to be. Not putting people into boxes, but really engaging at the level of ideas. Which brings me to this gentleman. <laughs> this gentleman, I think, embodies uh, the best of what ISGAP tries to achieve. And Harris Rafiq. I think is one of the is the serious the serious intellectual one of the leading intellectuals on this issue, and not only is he a leading intellectual on this issue, he's somebody with courage. I think unfortunately we all need a little bit of courage in this business. And Harris has um, I first met him in Jerusalem when he came to the Global Forum to speak on anti-Semitism. That was about six months ago. <laughs> Two thousand nine, I think. 2009, so we're getting there. And since that time, we've uh, been meeting and collaborating. 
So Harris is the managing director of the of Quilliam. He's all, he was formerly a member of the UK government task force looking at counter extremism in response to the 2005 bombings in London at Russell near Russell Square, as well as being a parameter for the IDA, IDEA, advising regional government agencies. He's also worked in, on a number of projects relating to the analysis of radicalization, as, a, as well as the de-radicalization of extremists, and has presented on a number of academic and political platforms nationally and internationally. Some of his, in some of his work, Harris is committed to countering xenophobia and hatred, and has spoken at many conferences and events, including the Global Forum on Combating Antisemitism, as well as a chair of a working group on, of global experts uh, forum on anti-Semitism in, in Ottawa of 2010. And I think, you know, as we've been saying, and, and some of us have been talking about it in this lecture, while some interests and some <coughs> powers and some ideological forces want to, I think in Joel's way, sort of in this irrational, neurotic way, whatever it is, focus on Israel, um, extremists, I would call them fascistic, fascist extremists, have really been uh, in the et, they've been effective in taking over community institutions, mosques. Now we see them taking over literally governments and military apparatus and spreading their ideology in all sorts of ways from schools to the battlefield. And we're living in a time, last year we were here discussing the, uh, the agreement between the P5 plus 1, and that was sort of the theme of the issue. A year later, we're in a situation where, you know, as we said yesterday, children are burning tires in the hope somehow that they'll create a no-fly zone over Aleppo. And many people are being <coughs> killed and refugees are being created and uncertainty is growing. And I even think that in the last year, if you want to talk about discrimination and racism, you know, what is the standing of the Muslim community in Europe today one year after last summer's summer program? What is happening to our notions of citizenship? What is happening to our notion of recognizing the other? You know, how is this conflict fraying democratic societies and our basic notion of who we are? And Harris, I really appreciate you being here, and Harris is really on the cutting edge of uh, confronting these, uh, these issues and other issues that he'll be speaking about today. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Charles. Thank you for that introduction. And although I, I remember the first time we met, uh, the second time we, we almost met, uh, the second interaction that we had is the one that left quite a bit of, um, quite a mark on, on me. And Charles, after we met, in, uh, in Jerusalem, uh, had invited me to come and give a lecture uh, at Yale, I think it was at the time, at ISCA. And uh, so Charles asked for my accreditation and details, etc. So I sent them over, and then all of a sudden, Charles got a barrage of people saying, No, you can't invite this guy, he's Islamophobic. What? He's Islamophobic? What? How can I be Islamophobic? I'm a Muslim. No, he's Islamophobic. And uh, that lecture didn't happen for various reasons, other reasons. And one of the things I, 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 I must say, Charles, is that through that whole episode and since, I've greatly admired your courage and your ability to stay focused on something, an agenda that really I think is one of the most important things that we're facing right now. Before I start, I just want to tackle that word Islamophobia and Islamophobia. Uh, for me, as a Muslim, and for the majority of Muslims, it's the wrong word. That word is absolute rubbish. And let me tell you why. And I've spoken about this at uh, the EU Parliament, I've spoken about this at the OSCE, and got Islamists to agree with me, who are on the panel with me. And I'll tell you why. Islam, I'm a Muslim, Islam is a set of ideas. It's a set of values. I choose to accept those ideas. I choose to accept those values. There are people the same color as me, same skin, different other, other, other colors as well, who are not Muslims. There are people who choose not to be Muslim. In a liberal, secular democracy, no set of ideas should be beyond critique. 
Islam, if it's a set of values, it's a set of ideas, I choose to accept them, should not be beyond critique. In fact, if the values that I choose, the ideas that I choose to accept, aren't strong enough, they won't face up to the critique. But no individual is beyond dignity. I can't change the colour of my skin. And nobody should hate me, nobody should show prejudice against me, either because of the colour of my skin, or because I choose to be a Muslim in a liberal, secular democracy. Which is why when we set up in the UK, and I was on the steering committee, a, an official government-backed authority, agency, well actually it's an NGO, uh, an NGO to actually measure the impact of what's happening to Muslims in terms of hate crimes, it wasn't called Islamophobia, it was called measuring anti-Muslim attacks. The word Islamophobia is used by the very people who don't want their particular version of Islam to be critiqued to try and deflect a particular uh, set of ideas. So the Islamophobia, and, and, and I'm happy to have questions on that afterwards, it's a false flag, it's, a, it's the wrong term. Anti-Muslim hatred does, does exist. Anti-Muslim attacks do exist. That's the right terminology. If we live in a liberal secular democracy, there's no problem with attacking or critiquing any set of values or ideas. So I'm going to talk about today in and out of extremism. And what I'm going to do is build on, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I've got a bit of a cold, so please excuse me. I'm going to build on the presentation that I gave here last year. So the first uh, two or three slides in the presentation, some of you who were here last year will recognise, but there's more information in there, some more research that's, that's gone into looking at the pathways of, of extremism. Um, and I, but I want to talk about a personal story. And why am I doing this? Why as a Muslim am I doing this? Why wasn't I doing this before? Well, my background is that I was born in 1965, born in the UK. My father came over in 1953. My mother's cousins, etc., were here in the 20s. And I was raised in a Muslim household, practicing Muslim household. Uh, and I grew up, and for my father, there was no dichotomy between being for him. He was always, even though he moved from India to Pakistan, and then from Pakistan to the UK, he always classed himself as Indian and Muslim, then Pakistani and Muslim, yeah, and then you know, maybe British and Muslim, but I was always British and Muslim with Pakistani heritage and roots. Learned Urdu, learned Punjabi, learned all my full obligations as a Muslim. But he allowed me the ability to practice my faith as a spiritual relationship between me and God. And secondly, when I was at school here in the UK in, 19, in, the, in the late 60s, early 70s onwards, we were only 5% of the population of the school at that time, and there was no such thing as faith-based identity politics. Nobody classified me by my faith. If people didn't like, if people wanted to, where am I from? It was Pakistani heritage, <coughs> Asian. If they didn't like me, they'd call me a Paki. That's how it was. Nobody said, oh, he's a Muslim. But then all of a sudden, we've got this faith-based identity politics coming into play now, which I'll talk about in a, in, a, in, a, in a while, about why that's so important to the radicalization process and to anti-Semitism within. And I'd say, the other thing I want to just correct, there's no such thing as the Muslim world. There's no such thing as the Muslim community. There are Muslim majority countries, and there are Muslim communities. And we all practice Islam differently, we speak a different language, we dress differently, some of us don't, or some people don't regard others as Muslims, even though they are Muslims. So, you know, this Muslim identity is something that I think we've got a faith-based identity policy, it's something we've got to park a little bit. So, I grew up and I, you know, practiced my faith. I, we had Kowali in our house, which was the devotional uh, hymns uh, that helped to spread uh, Islam through India. Uh, you know, five times prayers, fasting, etc. And I was a punk rocker when I was 14, 15, and then I joined CND, the campaign for nuclear disarmament, when I went to university, that was my rebellion. And then I left and got to work and worked in the commercial sector, ended up being on the board of Xerox UK and Cordwell and a whole number of companies. About 13 years ago now, my daughter, who was my youngest at the time, <coughs> excuse me, she's uh, 19 now, and that's a picture of her when she was sort of that age. She came home one day and said, Daddy, I don't want to be a Muslim. And I said, why? 
And she said, because Muslims are always angry, they're always killing people. I don't want to be angry, I don't want to kill anybody. Daddy, I don't want to be Muslim. And this struck a chord in me. Here was a young girl. She was about seven, just coming up to seven at the time. She didn't know anything about Islam, the faith. She didn't know anything about geopolitics. She didn't know anything, really, other than how to go to school, learning to read and write. She saw mummy and daddy praying. Mummy and daddy praying five times a day when they could be, when they were feeling particularly pious, fasting during Ramadan, you know, taught to be, you know, that we're Muslims. But she was getting these messages that to be a Muslim, she had to hate people. So I said, where are you getting these messages from? So she flicks over onto the television, and there were some guys, it happened to be the Taliban in those days, who were looking very angry, they were firing rifles, they were firing guns, they were burning effigies in George Bush, uh, George Bush and Tony Blair, and they looked as if they wanted to kill people, and they made it very clear they wanted to kill people. This started a process of self-reflection for me. You know, is this the faith that Muslims practice? I wasn't bothered. I was getting on with my life. I was, you know, doing, earning a lot more money than I'm earning now, as my wife can testify, having our holidays, numbers of holidays a year, whatever, etc. You know, getting on my life, as were, and still are, the overwhelming majority of, not just British Muslims, but people, citizens, individuals, academics, scholars, everybody, getting on with their lives. But this started a process of thinking, what's my faith all about? What is this girl, what message is she getting? So I then moved over to her, I mean she was an early adopter, she had a PC, uh, and she had email, etc. Then she showed me all these emails from her cousin. Don't buy, don't shop at McDonald's, because if you go to McDonald's, you're going to spend money, and each pound that you spend is going to go and buy weapons for Israelis and Jews to kill Pakistanis. Then said Muslims, said Pakistanis. And there was all these things and all these text messages I was getting, etc. So I thought there's something going on here. So I, I got, got my backpack and travelled around the world and ended up in some very, very strange places uh, and eventually came full circle that the uh, Islam that my parents brought to the UK is Islam that the overwhelming majority of Muslims around the world do practice. And you know, the overwhelming majority of Muslims in the world aren't into extremism, aren't into Islamism, and I'm going to use the word Islamism, I'm going to define it in a minute and tell you why it's so important that we do use the word Islamism. And, uh, you know, people aren't Islamists, and, you know, people are not. But there is something going on. So I left my job and set up two companies, one to pay the bills and the other one to do some in-depth research. And I ended up uh, 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 using Manchester University, Salford, Salford University in Manchester, Two PhDs there, two professors, to actually say, let's do the largest survey of Muslims in the UK on different things, you know, attitudinal beliefs on various different things. At that time, the largest was 1,500 Muslims in the UK. This is 2003. Face-to-face -face surveys, uh, questionnaires, and there was one, the answer to one blank question, sorry, one open question that frightened the life out of me. I wasn't expecting it. And the question was, name a Muslim role model. 4 point something percent of Muslims that responded, 1,500 people up and down the country, 51% women, 49% male, different social economic backgrounds, it was done properly. But just under 5% of Muslims in Britain responded to that question by saying, Osama bin Laden, <coughs> I just wasn't expecting it. Out of 1,500 Muslims surveyed in 2003, you know, 40% of the Muslims were under the age of, sorry, 70% of the Muslims were under the age of 40, as per the demographics, half of them under 25, etc., etc. It was all done properly. Just under 5% said it was only been like They could have said anyone. So that frightened the life out of me, and I ended up saying, I've got to do something with this. So I ended up at the government. I never had any government involvement before. And I ended up at the Foreign Office in those days because they had this very patronising team called Engaging with the Islamic World. <laughs> you know, that was the almost colonial. Let's let's go, you know, let's go ahead and go forth and conquer. And uh, that was the only government department in, in the UK at the time that looked at these kind of issues. And they laughed at me and they said, ah don't worry. We won't have a 9-11 here in the UK. Our, and our Muslims, this, our Muslims in the UK are much better than the Muslims in the US was the answer I got. Don't worry. You know, the people here, Abu Hamza, 
or Mabakri, all these kind of people, don't worry, we're engaging with them. And by the way, these are the guys who are radicalizing the jihad. Uh, uh, Manwar Ali, uh, Sheikh Osama Hassan, don't worry, these guys won't carry out anything here. But you know, I felt a little bit deflated, but I thought, these guys are the experts, I've done my duty, let me go and carry on and do some more research into radicalization. 7-7 happened in 2005, and within 24 hours, I was in Downing Street, telling the Prime Minister at the time what I had found and what the focus of my research had been since then. I ended up becoming an advisor to Tony Blair at the time, and then to Hazel Blair's um, and to Ruth Kelly, Secretaries of State, Home Office, Foreign Office, a whole range of people. And then, uh, more recently, until about three weeks ago, I sat on uh, the official task force that David Cameron had, which is a counter extremism forum. Uh, and now uh, I'm about to become an advisor to the new Prime Minister as well. So that's sort of my journey. Quillian as an organisation. Oh, by the way, I said I'd talk about Islamism, why the word Islamism is very important. We, there is a distinct and clear difference between the word Islam and Islamism. Just as there is between social and socialism. Social is a way that we all, we all interact. Based on that, socialism is a distinct political ideology which happens to be left of center. I'm not criticizing it, I'm not criticizing it, it just is. You know, I'm, as a liberal, you know, I, I accept all political ideologies. Some of them need to be challenged as a liberal. So, similarly, Islam is a faith, as I mentioned, practiced by Muslims differently. Different languages, different interpretations. There are over 400 legitimate versions of jurisprudence measured by the largest Sunni uh, uh, seats of learning, the oldest Sunni seats of learning at Azhar University in Cairo, that are legitimate, and many of them don't even regard each other as Muslims. So it's practiced differently, but Islamism is a distinct political ideology that wants two things. It wants to, first of all, set up a utopian Islamist caliphate and enforce a version of Sharia, of jurisprudence, as state law. That's never been done in Islam. Never. Anyone who tries to tell you that's been done, since the Prophet Muhammad peace upon him, doesn't know his stuff. It's never been done. Secondly, it wants to spread that across the world and it will not stop until it raises, in their words, the flag of jihad across the world. The world. That's Islamism. Jihad is a personal struggle. <coughs> there are 13 scholarly classifications of the word jihad. And it's a great paper if anybody wants a reference to it. I can give, you, give it to you afterwards. Uh, from my, one of my teachers. And by the way, I have the jazzers on a whole number of... Ijazas is the traditional method of Islamic learning um, for up until 1400 years. It's a bit like Star Wars. You have the, you have the, you have the Jedi and you have the, the, uh, the, the Padawan and then once the Padawan actually gets to a certain level, it has Ijazah permission and then can go out and teach. And so I, from some of the leading Islamic scholars in the world. Jihad is a struggle. Jihad, there are 13, 13 classifications of it. The lowest one is where you pick up arms, but there's a whole other, it has to be state-driven rather than an individual can't call jihad, uh, pick up arms and call for people to pick up arms. The number one jihad is jihad al-Akbar. From the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, when after he came back from the battle, he, people were, were asked about the jihad, he said, well, we've just gone from the lower jihad to the greater jihad. And he said, what's the greater jihad? He said, the jihad, and jihad al-Akbar. And he said, the greater jihad is the day-to-day -day struggle that an individual has to do good rather than evil. But jihadism does exist, and it's separate from jihad. Jihadism is the use of force to implement the Islamist state. That's why we've been saying for years, and now we're seeing it, we're living in a time of a global jihadist insurgency. ISIS as a, as a state does not... Its ability to exist as a proto state is gone. It's lost 40% of its land in Iraq, it's lost about 12 to 15 percent of its land in Syria. <coughs> Excuse me. Its economic, its earning potential power has gone from somewhere in the region of about three million dollars a day to about a million dollars a day uh, from oil and the black market and extortion, etc., which we can get onto. But the ideology still exists, and one of the biggest mistakes we can make is just to talk about ISIS 
as, a, as an organization, we need to counter. Because 10 years ago, we were talk now we're talking about ISIS-inspired extremism. 10 years ago, we were talking about Al-Qaeda-inspired extremism. We talked about Muslim Brotherhood-inspired extremism. Well, ISIS and Al-Qaeda did not inspire extremism. Extremism inspired them. Key to remember. In five years' time, ten years' time, there will be a different acronym that we will be talking about until, unless we get to grips with this problem. So why is Islamism important, the word? Well, in the UK, we're having a nuanced debate. Our government, our leaders actually show, it's not where it should be, but it's a step in the right direction. We're starting to have a nuanced debate, and it's been a long struggle. We use the word Islamism, and we differentiate it from Islam. So does our government, so do a whole range of people, which means that we haven't got, the, we haven't got people like Donald Trump. We haven't got populist far right. The biggest populist far right party in this organization, sorry, uh, organization in the UK that goes on marches is now a march called, an organization called Pegida, very big in, the, in Europe. Here, at the last march, they had 250 people. That's it. We're having this nuanced debate. You know, we've got the regressive left that say there is this problem that we're facing has got nothing to do with Islam at all. And then we've got the far right populists that say it's all Islam and all Muslims. The reality is somewhere in the middle. It has got something to do with Islam and some interpretations, I'm not going to talk about that, it, but it's not all Muslims. And if we have that debate, we have to name the ideology, we have to name what it is, because the general public aren't stupid. If someone says, Allah Akbar, which I say when I pray, but, uh, but a jihadist will say when he blows himself up, and says I'm doing this in the name of religion, if we don't see leadership from our scholars, if we don't see leadership from our activists, from our government, on defining what the problem is, the general public will define the debate. And then we see people like Donald Trump, who I call the presidential troll, by the way, <laughs> on CNN, live to his face. Uh, well, he was, he was there last year, uh, after he said that uh, Muslims should be banned from coming into the US. But that's a different story. Um, so it's very, very important because if you don't define the debate, if you don't take control of the debate from a scholarly, from an activist led, from a government led perspective, what happens is you get polarization. The discussion starts being anti Semitism is good, anti Semitism is bad, Islam is good, Islam is bad. That's, that's, that's the nuance of the debate. We're living in a time of political grievance. People are angry, upset, and will buy things online very, very quickly. In 140 characters, I told the child today, say, you must go on Twitter. Now, can I say, mention why, a bit why. People are living in that time, we've got to take hold. You know, we've got to get, somehow, we've got to get the fatwas into 140 characters. We've got to get the scholarly uh, um, um, papers, the discussions, into 140 characters. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but that's the point. People don't have attention span of the general public. ISIS are doing it well. We're not. <clears throat> Yet. But the difference is, as I, was, I said to somebody the other day, that, but we have PR companies that have been telling people what shampoo to buy for decades now. We do know how to do it well. We just haven't got there yet. So, the other thing I will just say is that, <coughs> excuse me, ISIS, IS, Islamic State, Daesh, uh, by the way, anyone who says use Daesh instead of ISIL, is, is it makes me laugh because Daesh means ISIL. <laughs> and said, oh, as if we're going to use the word Daesh, you may have come across some people saying use it, as if we're going to, Daesh in Arabic means Islamic State of Iraq and Levant. <laughs> in Arabic, that's what it means. <laughs> it's crazy as if we're going to change the name and drop these leaflets on Iraq and Syria and they're going to disappear. But it's just, it just makes me laugh. Uh, anyway, but there are supposed reasons. And, and we've got to name and, and President Obama made a great speech about two years ago where he said there's an evil ideology at play. forgot to mention what the ideology was. And to me, it was almost like a, a, the Voldemort effect. You know, you shall not be named. We've got to name it. We've got, to, we've got to name the problem. An alcoholic can't cure himself or herself until he or she admits there's a problem. We've got to admit we've got a problem. And anti-Semitism is part of the Islamist problem. Uh, it's the fuel. It's one of the opium of uh, what drives it, and I'll show you that in a minute. The last thing I'll say before we move on to, to the slides. Islamic State, IS, 
Daesh, ISIL, Al Qaeda, whatever you want to call it, whoever's the flavor of the month. Uh, Jabhat al Nusra, I think, a couple of days ago, officially left Al Qaeda, but they haven't. Not really. The tenets of belief are still the same. They just put, you know, marketing packaging. But ISIL, Al Qaeda, etc., do not radicalize anybody. They don't radicalize anybody. They haven't got the ability to radicalize people. What they do is they take people who are radicalized to a particular worldview and then tip some of them over the edge, a small number. And that's the key. What we're doing at the moment, in some places, is we're trying to tackle the symptoms, give the penicillin for the disease. But we're not inoculating people against what the problem is in the first place. So I'll move on for now. So what am I going to talk about? I'm going to show a very quick video. Uh, I'm going to talk about CVE. Are you guys all familiar with what the CVE strategy is? The CVE strategy is a strategy that in the US, the White House, uh, the State Department came up with. It's countering violent extremism. Uh, I, it's a failed strategy, and I'll tell you why it's failed. I'll tell you where the holes are. Uh, the reason why I know it's a failed strategy and the holes are, I, I initially wrote it in 2005, 2006, and the politicians here didn't take all of my recommendations. Uh, <clears throat> and it's evolved here in the UK, but it hasn't evolved in the US yet. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the pathways. I'm going to look at online <coughs> extremism. I'm going to look at the IS propaganda, why it's effective. I'm also then going to talk about some solutions, because that's important as well. I don't want to just stand up here and just be negative, 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 negative. I want to talk about some of the solutions that we and other organisations are using, because the fight back has started. But it's very, very small. Uh, at this moment in time, it needs to reach a critical mass. Uh, and some existing campaigns and some more videos. So what I'm going to do, first of all, is show you a video. And then I'll show the others after the, uh, the break. So we've all heard, seen ISIS's videos of beheading, etc., etc. So one of the things we did uh, about a year and a half ago is we started working with a PR company and started putting together online strategies and counter-narratives and alternative narratives to try and counter people going to join ISIL. And just to give you a flavour, approximately a year ago, on average, there were about 2,000 people joining ISIL in Iraq and Syria every week. Uh, now the numbers come down to about 200, and that's from around the world. So this is something, and it's won numerous awards from The Guardian and various other places around the world. And this is one of the videos that we made. And it's about, this particular video, is about recognizing that the words that we have, the words we use, have an impact on other people. So, just have a look at some of the weekend. What did you do with white stuff? White strong? Strong. Hey, bro. I know right now I don't want to talk to you. The thing is, I wish I could see your face now. I tell you I was sorry. I tell you that I wish I could take back every time I sent you a tweet or got all gassed up saying how the West has turned it back on us. Saying, that I wasn't known for Mujahid. I could see what the brothers in Syria were fighting for. Because that's what it all changed, wasn't it? And you started sending me all those ISIL films. Going to those meetings you wouldn't tell me about. You just threw all that stuff I said back in my face. Had it been said that we should fight for what we believed in, I knew. I, I, when I said fight, not like that. Not if it means the last memory I've got of my kid brother is him saying, I thought this was what you wanted, bro. I thought you wanted me to be a hero. I tell you, get it. You've been my hero since the day you were born. So please, just come on. I'm sorry, bro. And I hope they're treating you like the hero always thought you were. This is a campaign that we run. Off the back of this and other campaigns, just to give you an idea, we get, I get on average five emails every week. 
this is what I get. The other people in the organization get, get some as well. But I get an average five emails every week from family, friends, okay, don't just that. From families, friends of people, Muslims, saying, can you help us? We think that our brother, our friend, relative, whatever, uh, might be going down a particular path of radicalization, can you help us? And we do. Just a very quick word on Quilliam Foundation, which I should have done, but I didn't. Uh, as an organization, this time last year we had seven people working for us in the UK, now we have 18 people. Uh, and some of the leading academic scholars on Islamic theology, people who've been extremists in the past, uh, and we do a whole range of different things. We monitor ISIS, we have a creative arts department, we do counter strategy, counter, we advise and we do academic research. It's a great report, uh, study I'd recommend using, uh, you guys reading, <coughs> from last year called From Dimitude to Democracy, which is done by Sheikh Dr. Osama Hassan. It's on our website. Uh, and it's 140 pages, or it's a 40 page abridged version as well, some unique research in there as well about how these concepts that many people will use, are using right now, ISIS and others, uh, of dimitude, uh, were defunct. The Ottomans got rid of them, and other people got rid of them, and how they don't no longer uh, are, are relevant in this modern day. But within the organization, our president, Noman bin Ottoman, has a $25 million bounty on his head from Al Qaeda. He used to be one of Osama bin Laden's commanders in uh, uh, Afghanistan against the Soviets. Uh, his job was to train people on how to fight and to train them on ideological and theological grounds. We're just coming up to the point, we found the actual syllabus that ISIS used to indoctrinate people on the ground in Iraq and Syria, the indigenous people and people who come in. 600 pages in Arabic, we've just translated it and we've just done a commentary and we'll be probably uh, releasing that in September. Just to give you a flavour of what's in there, theological academic arguments on how you can justify eating other people. Yeah. If you're in jihad, as they call it, and you're hungry, the person next to you is not a proper Muslim. I don't, I'm not a proper Muslim, neither are the majority of Muslims. I say that groups Islamists are more anti, for a driving anti-Muslim hatred more than anybody else. And the very first people, the majority of victims that Islamists, jihadists are killing are Muslims. There's a civil war going on within Islam. And it's, and it's, it's sort of <laughs> traveling over to the rest of the world. But it's a civil war that Muslims need, need to, to take on, but also it affects everybody else and we all need to take on. We need to treat this phenomenon in the same way that we treat fascism or racism. Take it away from the religion and focus on the utopian, totalitarian, fascist ideology that it is. Uh, and I'll again talk about why. why. And, it, and if we don't, well, we know what happened. We know what's happened in the past. The utopian, fascist, totalitarian ideologies are not tackled and not challenged. So, but going back to it, so we have a son, a former a commander of Osama bin Laden, who's our president. We have Majid Nawaz, who is a chairman who served four years in the past in Egypt for trying to instigate a military coup for an Islamist organization, Hizbut Tahrir. Uh, we have Sheikh Dr. Osama Hassan, who's also fought combative jihad in Afghanistan. Anjum, uh, uh, have you guys heard of Anjum Chowdhury? <coughs> Anjum Chowdhury, the British so-called go-to scholar for Fox and CNN, who if you want to you know, have somebody who calls for jihad on TV, he's the guy they wheel on. Uh, well, I can tell you, it's a Friday today. Yeah, it is. I can tell you last Friday, is this Chatham House? It's not, is it? Okay. Um, are we, this won't go out on air anyway, will it, until, <coughs> next, by, until next week? No, for a couple of months. Uh, there's a, there's a, there's, a, there's an embargo on reporting this uh, because his trial affects another trial. He was found guilty last week of material support for uh, jihadism. And last Friday, he's going to be sentenced on the 8th of September. I was there at the trial. Uh, we gave evidence, and uh, he, you know, at last, he's going to, you know, he's going to. <coughs> but, you know. We, 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 we have these kind of people that we need to tackle and we need to challenge. So, well, his organisation, and Adam Dean, who used to be a very senior member there, is, is with us. So we have a whole range of people uh, that have seen it, done it, been there, academics, theologians, who were on the wrong side of the fence at one time, but have now disavowed the whole ideology and theology. 
And this is why, as an organisation, we've seen some of the success that we've had, because we're able to talk to people on a, on, on, with using the same language that people will understand. One of our guys doing de-radicalisation work went to somebody who was fighting out in Libya and, and then Syria and said, yeah, did you buy weapons from such and such a place when you were out there? He said, yeah, we did. He said, they didn't work, did they? He said, no, they didn't. He said, the springs were sold off, weren't they? Exactly. Instant rapport. People who've done things together. And that's one of the reasons why I think as an organisation we've grown and you know, welcome, anybody's welcome to have a look at our website and see and visit us and Charles and I are going to carry on working. And we're growing and we're going into the US and Canada, uh, hopefully within the next 12 months, Australia, France and other places. Right, so, let's look at the CVE strategy. So, CVE strategy is about that thick, or you can look at this one slide. <laughs> <coughs> So when we came up with this, we thought, okay, the Barstool test, the elevator page, how do you describe it, the whole strategy in one, in one, in one slide? If we take the, the red as attitudinal beliefs of Muslims anywhere in the world, it can be anywhere. In this case, let's say the, U, the UK, at any given time, X percent, and the numbers change and vary. And I don't, and I don't like putting numbers up there because, you know, uh, Sometimes they can be frightening, and by the time you put numbers up there, they're out of date anyway. Um, but X percent of Muslims, and a small number, a uh, very small number of Muslims at any given time, will directly support, and do directly support, ISIS and Al-Qaeda and Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab, jihadist organizations. Y percent sympathize. What sympathy? Well, sympathy is Muslim Brotherhood, Jamaat Islami. People like this who say, you know what, I don't believe in Baghdadi as the Khalif. I don't believe in that particular Islamic state, but I believe in the concept. I believe that in an ideal Islamic state, if someone sets it up and someone changes their faith from Islam to another one, they should be killed. I believe in an ideal Islamic state, if someone is gay, you should throw them off the mountain. Even though the, the Ottomans got rid of it, the, the criminalization of homosexuality in the 1800s, the Tanzimat reforms, from a Sharia perspective, a law perspective. I believe in an ideal Islamic state, if someone steals, their hand should be chopped off. That's sympathy. And Z% percent empathize. Z% percent the empathy is, you know what, I don't believe, I don't agree with what they're doing, but I kind of understand why they're doing it. I don't believe in the fact that guy, people, two guys, the Kwachi brothers, should have gone and killed and murdered Charlie Hebdo. But I kind of understand why they did it. Because they were being blasphemous, they were drawing these cartoons. Well, let me tell you something on the record. Gilles de Kakov, who is the head of the EU counterterrorism, said on a public platform in Prague, where I was speaking on the same panel as him, that the shortest time he has seen, observed, someone showing empathy was measured as showing empathy to becoming operational as a jihadist is two weeks. The shortest time I've observed in three cases, one in Canada, one in Holland and one in the UK, is one and a half weeks. But I never say that. I, I'd rather use his words. There's a guy called Ziamani. By all means, look at his case. Last January, he was sentenced to 22 years in the UK for trying to emulate the killing of Drummer Lee Rigby. For those of you who don't know what happened, Drummer Lee Rigby was an off-duty soldier who was hacked to death mm -hmm. by two jihadists. He was, he was out on his way, with a bag, machete and a hammer. He was being observed, luckily, and he was stopped. He was found guilty through the due process, charged for 22 years. Three and a half months before he was found, before he was caught, he was a Christian. He wasn't even Muslim. Bear that in mind. Why is it important? Why is it important that we focus on this now and not tomorrow? Because 10 years ago, when I first got involved in this, that particular sharp end of the CVE was much smaller than it is now. Much smaller. The numbers were way, way smaller. Not necessarily in the support, but in the sympathy and empathize sections. Much, much smaller. And in here, 
What we need when this happens is a direct intervention of some sort. If the person is dangerous, arrest them. If the person uh, hasn't yet committed a crime and is on the way to uh, uh, becoming radicalised, in the same way that we work with um, gang members, in the same way that we work with other people through a voluntary pro process, help to de-radicalise and rehabilitate them. And we have channel programmes here in the UK. The number of potential terrorist attacks that have been stopped in the UK because we have this channel program. France doesn't have it, Germany doesn't have it, Belgium doesn't have it, the US doesn't have it. Canada is about to start developing this one now, and we're advising on that. De-radicalisation and then rehabilitation. In schools right now, my wife can testify, the prevent duty of care has now become a safeguarding issue. If there are people in school, teachers now in schools, in the same way that they look at racism, in the same way that they look at child sexual grooming, see people being groomed and don't do something about it, somebody can go to prison. I'm not, necessarily, I'm not saying that necessarily we should have legislation to do it, but that's the way it is right now. So that's the sharp end. That's not something I guess the majority of people here in this room will get involved in. The soft end, building resilient communities. How do we provide the resilience? How do we build inoculation? How do we actually challenge? You know, we have a mantra. For people who are not breaking the law, we need to, we must, because we don't need any more legislation. We don't need more draconian laws. For people who are not breaking the law, we have to have legal tolerance. But if they're showing fascist views, we have to have civil intolerance. We need to challenge them. Everybody here, everybody in society, we need to challenge them. And if we don't, that sharp end is just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. That's what's been happening. You know, if someone wants to see me offline, I can give you the numbers in the UK and other places. But not for broadcasts and not for sort of, you know, these are numbers that are perhaps frightening for some people. But building the resilient communities is how we prevent this from happening. How we prevent people from becoming angry, how we prevent people from joining Islamist jihadist organisations. If we don't do that, we're just tackling the symptoms. And by the way, where are the holes? I said I'd show you some holes. <coughs> in the UK, we tried something in 2008. And what we tried was to get people who are in this space, I'm going to throw some names in, people like in the US care. People like in the US, um, I don't know about the organizations, other organizations, I'm sure you care and other organizations in the US. To try, and by the way, who are these organizations? They believe in the utopian Islamic State, just not this version, their own version. How you get there. Every single Islamic, sorry, every single Islamist organization in their manifesto believes the two things I talked about. And spreading it around the world involves fighting. Every Islamist organization at some stage in their strategy, even if they come to power democratically, involves fighting. It does. But maybe not now. And we get fooled sometimes. So we tried, in the, in the UK, organizations that fit into this space to try and bring these people back. To stop them being violent. And the reasoning was, well, they speak their language. They speak, they're able to bring them back. They're not violent. And by the way, these people, if we can like them, if, they, if we can get them to like us, everything will be fine. You know, they're part of the ideology and, 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 and theology. Let's get them to bring them back. In the UK, it failed. I can give you case study after case study. And we didn't do that, this part of the resilient communities. We are now doing it now. We didn't do that, we just focused on containment rather than cure, and that's what's happening in the US right now. We didn't, in, they've taken our failed strategy of 2009, because we did this in 2008 to 2010, then we stopped, when we saw people just being contained and then going off and committing these acts somewhere else, the covenants of security. We stopped it, we're doing that now. But the US is not doing that. The US is still getting these people, engaging these people, who are political animals, to try and bring these people back. You've got a ticking time bomb in the, U in the US. 
right now. Because all that happens is this gets bigger and bigger, and these people, if they're here, will never take them further back. The real resilient communities are moving that graph to the left as much as we can. There'll always be some overlap. Of course there will. But that's how we build resilient communities. And if we use these people, forget it. It's containment. It's not going to work. We didn't work here. It's not, it hasn't worked anywhere else. So I don't see how it's going to work in the US. But, and I've told people at the State Department, and they are looking into it. But whether they change it or not, who knows. Right. Let's move on to some of the pathways. I'm going to take these particular slides in twos. <clears throat> We've all heard that you know, people who are disenfranchised, people who are uneducated, people who are poverty driven, people who are poor, etc., become jihadists. Rubbish. 52% of all convicted Islamist terrorists in the UK before, so Islamist jihadists in the UK before 2014, because that was the last study, have a university degree. 47% of all convicted Islamist jihadists in the UK are white collar. You have doctors, you have surgeons, you have a whole range of people. Osama bin Laden was an engineer. Zwahiri, the current leader of Al-Qaeda, is a paediatrician. The top leaders of his Tahrir here in the UK are doctors, consultants, surgeons. So what's going on? Well, the other thing you'll hear is foreign policy. Foreign policy drives people to go out and become Islamists, terrorists. I will concede to anybody that that is the case if that person can tell me what has our foreign policy or US foreign policy got to do with Muslims leaving the UK, traveling to Iraq and Syria and killing other Muslims? What has our foreign policy got to do with Muslims from our countries going to Iraq and Syria and taking Yazidi sex slaves. If someone can prove to me the direct correlation, I'll concede it. But it has got something. There is something in there. So, what are the pathways? Well, the lens in the middle, you've got the grievances on the left and you've got the solutions on the right. And by the way, Charles, do you remember me first putting up this slide and saying mental health in 2010? Do you remember? Okay. <laughs> Right, well, and I'll, I'll, we'll talk about why that's relevant in a minute. Because now, whenever we see, uh, recently when we've been hearing jihadists uh, attack people, we're saying, oh, it's not jihadists, it's not sex, it's mental health. Well, the two aren't mutually exclusive. Not everybody who suffers from mental health is going to go out and blow themselves up. Not everybody who suffers from mental health is going to go and kill people because he or she believes that they're going <coughs> to get redemption. They're going to be a martyr. But mental health is an issue. Okay, so. On the left-hand side, we've got these grievances, three types, per, uh, genuine personal grievances, partial and perceived. Everybody in this room at any given time has a grievance. Right now, or when we go home tonight and sleep in our own beds, we'll all have a grievance, we'll all have a problem that we think about. And to me, my problem is much greater than yours. But in reality, how big is that problem really compared to somebody in Darfur? How big is that problem compared to somebody in other parts of Africa who, often, who can't, I can't even get water, basic food and water? But to me, it's huge. Personal grievance. You guys uh, may have heard of Sadiq Khan, not the mayor, but Sadiq Khan, the leader of the 7-7 bombers uh, in 2005. Sadiq Khan, his personal grievance that drew him to becoming a jihadist was he fell in love. He was a teacher. He went to university. He um, what, had a girlfriend at university. As if he must have. And he wanted to marry her. Yeah, he did me causing for about three and a half years. He wanted to marry her. Went home to his father. Dad, I want to marry her. I want to marry her. I won't mention her because it's not fair. Dad, I want to marry, marry, uh, I want to marry my girlfriend. My fiance. She's now my fiance, but I haven't told you. And the father said, No, you've got to marry your cousin from Pakistan who you've only met twice in your life. He had a problem. There were people, part of Anjum Chowdhury's group, that happens to. Yeah, it's not a coincidence, but it happens to be al Muhajirun in those days, who gave him theological responses back to his father on what he could say to him to pers persuade his father from the Qur'an that you're not a proper Muslim by forcing me to do this. And guess what the father conceded? He now had a new family, a new identity. We'll talk about that in the middle. Then you've got partial grievances. Of course, foreign policy. I mean, I, I'm one of 
a million people that marched against the Iraq war in 2000, uh, whatever it was, when we went into Iraq. There are grievances that are based on a partial truth. There are problems with some of our foreign policy, of course there are. No country's foreign policy is entirely perfect. But there are good things in our foreign policy as well. But people will play, charismatic recruiters in the middle will play all these partial grievances to bring people in. What has Israel and Palestine got to do with people travelling all these miles to go and kill other Muslims? But it's important in the recruitment process. And the next slide will tell you why. And then there's perceived grievances. Grievances aren't even grievances. And the story I've told before is where a guy that we've de-radicalised was on a train, saw a young woman with a hijab, recognised her as Muslim, young child. She was reading something on the front page that was about a star, former star, who had been found guilty of paedophilia and child, sexual child grooming. He very quickly thought, and this is a guy, you know, university educated, senior member of his battalion, I don't know, uh, senior member of his battalion, he recognised, I thought it wasn't David, I just said hi to him, <laughs> uh, senior member of his battalion who suddenly realised that at that moment in time, that woman, that mother, must be thinking about, must have a concern about her child. So he went up to her and said, you know what, you're never going to find safety for your child. You never, never met her before. You know what? It's a real problem. The Western society is immoral. It's corrupt. The Jews control the media. This is all the Jews doing all of this. You know, the Jews control all the stars. The Jews, you know, have a history of treating children badly. Guess what? They just want other people to do it. There's no, no security for you in our society unless you join our gang and join the global Islamist Ummah gang. That's what I call them. It's a gang. And in the middle, we've got the intellectual, the ideological, social, emotional, spiritual aspects of the narrative, push and pull factors, and people talk about online and offline. I've actually heard some crazy, crazy so-called academics stand on a platform and say, the internet radicalises people. Well, you don't go online to buy a pair of shoes or a hand, handbag and accidentally end up becoming a jihadist. You have to be looking for something or somebody has to find you. Every single jihadist, and we've done research into this extensively for a number of years, apart from one person, every single jihadist in the West that's been convicted has had direct contact with somebody. All the internet is, is a space. It used to be mosques, it used to be community centres. And this is why Charles needs to go online, because people are online. People are on Twitter. People are doing what we should be doing, if we're serious about taking our academic studies to the masses, we need to go online. ISCAP needs to be more active online. And then there's solutions on the right-hand side. But I just want to talk about this in a bit more depth. So I talked about genuine grievances, I talked about the partial grievances, uh, and then obviously the, things, uh, uh, the solutions on the right. In the middle, what is the lens designed to do? And this is where I say ISIS does not radicalise anybody. The lens is decided to enact seven key behaviours. The first one, the otherization. The people inside the lens, the prison, the gang, are different to everybody outside. Everybody outside is driven by the Jews. I'm apparently... A Zyokon. <laughs> you go online and search my name Zyokon. Apparently, I'm a Zionist and a Neocon, and they abbreviated it to Zyokon. Well, I'm far from a Neocon. <laughs> um, but, again, the Jews, not Israel, the Jews are driven. Rothschilds, other Jews, are, are the people who are controlling the other. Then there's the collectivization, the second stage. Everybody outside the lens is the same. And other Muslims as well. To the left of the lens. Then the oppression narrative. Everybody outside of the lens is oppressing them inside the lens. Then you've got the collective guilt. And by the way, people who aren't oppressing them, by the very fact that they're not doing anything to actually counter the, impression, uh, the oppression, the inverted commas, is complicit in the oppression. Up until now, no violence. These are ideas. 
challenge those ideas. We need to, they need to be challenged because if they're not, and this is the sympathy and empathy. Then we've got the supremacism narrative. This is where it starts to get nasty. Everybody in the group is superior to those outside. Then on stages six, and up until then, ISIS doesn't get involved. Al Qaeda doesn't get involved. It's people in universities that do it. It's people in schools that are doing it. It's people online that are doing it. You know, Hizbut Tahrir, Muslim Brotherhood, I can show you their strategies on how they targeted in 2008, no, before that, in 2003 and 4, how they're going to go into universities, set up Islamic societies and university commerce and others to recruit people to the cause. And they're doing it. We're trying to counter it, but they are doing it. Not a whole deal, but not to violence, but just to the first one to, one to five stages. And then people, some people leave, leave as well themselves. Some people go in, some people... Like I, when I joined CND, I was in for a while and then left. But when they get to six and seven, that's when they believe that self-defense is absolutely imperative. And then the idea of violence, that violence is the only way, and what they're told is that the solutions are the utopian Islamist state, that's God's game, the theological justification, let's face up to it. There is an interpretation of Islam that was set up in, uh, in the 1800s that was born, yeah, by Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, who got it from Ibn Taymiyyah, who got it from the Khawarijites, to fight the colonial Ottoman Empire that justifies this. That is Salafism. And there are three <coughs> forms of Salafism. Quietist, revolutionary, and jihadist. But al-wala al-bara, within Salafi traditions, justifies this. Jihad kitab, within Salafi traditions, justifies this. That tradition says that if, once this so-called jihad has been called, once this utopian Islamist state has been called for, which is the political side of it, you can't be in God's gun unless you join it. And by the way, God will reward you for it. All these guys have done is taken fascism from Europe, imported it into the Middle East in the 1920s and 30s, say Qutb, Mufti Amin, uh, yeah, Mufti Amin, and a number of others. And instead of doing it for the state, or instead of doing it for the people with communism, do it for God. They put in the God factor. And then we've got revenge. Revenge is becoming more and more of a solution for people now as well, because we've got the drone attacks in Pakistan. You know, Obama did say that he would uh, stop the drone attacks, but there are more drone attacks that have taken place under Obama than Bush, I think, and than anybody else. Um, but there are people who have relatives, who know people, who have been affected by this, the war on terror, and who want revenge. Then the final one, solutions to mental health. Al-Qaeda, this was a paper that was delivered in the White House in 2006, by, I think it was by Sheikh Bani, or maybe Hedi Amirahman, that I was there. I, I was there. Al-Qaeda in 2006 had a strategy of hacking medical accounts, uh, uh, hacking medical records, and targeting people who suffer from mental health issues. In a country in Scandinavia, I think it's the name of the country then, which I'm not allowed to, a country in Scandinavia, they actually diagnosed more than 40% of their convicted Islamist jihadists as suffering from Asperger's syndrome. The, you know, we talk about now the guy from Orlando who mental health issues, of course. Of course there is something wrong with somebody who wants to go and blow himself up. Of course there is. But something is taking them to that point and it's the solution. If you look at ISIS's recruitment video, the very first one that most people saw was sitting around a campfire, almost. The guy on the, on, on the right hand side from Scotland talked about come to the land of jihad as a cure for depression. He was depressed for so long. <coughs> one of the killers of Drummer Lee Rigby was being treated for clinical depression because he witnessed his best friend being murdered in front of him many years before. These are solutions that have been provided by people, but the key is the lens in the middle. In the lens in the middle, there are certain key things that are the few. And one of them, it's not the only one, anti-Semitism. Anti-Israel. Focus on this, 
focus on this and get on with the rest. Why are these same people focusing on Darfur where more Muslims die in Darfur in one year at the hands of other Muslims than have died in the whole Israel-Palestine conflict? Why aren't these people focusing on Kashmir? Why are these people focusing on... Because this helps them with the partial grievance, believe the otherization, and who is the other? Amongst other people, other Muslims like me and others, Jews. Without the Jews, it becomes harder for them. Or without anti-Semitism, it becomes harder for them to create this lens in the middle. In the 1980s, I mean, it's not the only fuel, by the way, but it is it's, it's one of the fuels. The 1980s, my father sat me down and said, son, before I went to university, um, people hate Jews. What's it all about? I said, what do you mean, Dad? He said, are, are people are starting to say Jews this, Jews this, and saying, I, I, I went to a mosque on Eid two years ago, the imam, a mod moderate imam, maybe two or three years ago, when there was the Israel-Gaza uh, thing going on during Ramadan. Eid sermon, a khutbah, told people not to buy Coca-Cola. Because each bottle of Coca-Cola is buying a bullet, it's killing a Muslim. <coughs> Tesco's, yeah, my wife just gave me another one, Tesco's, she was there. Tesco, don't go to Tesco's. She's reminding me, you were there, yeah, you were there. Reminding me of all, all, all these kind of things. My father in the 80s said, what's this all about? You know, you know, I said, what do you mean, Dad? I said, somebody told me that to be a Muslim, I had to hate Jews. But it was totally alien to him. My father was a scholar amongst the Sufi traditions of Islam, follower of Hanafi tradition. He never ever incorporated in India, when he came to Britain, anti-Semitism. Why, why all of a sudden are we going to hate Jews? But now, people are telling people that the only way you can become God's gang is to be anti-Semitic and hate the Jews. Why? Because they're God's enemies, they're your enemies. It's part of it, it's part of it. It's part of the otherization. So, oh, I'm just thinking, looking at the time, I'm actually taking longer than I thought of, but I'll just go on for another 14 minutes and then crack on. So, online extremism. Interesting, some interesting facts. In, during the so-called jihadist incur, uh, um, uh, incursion in Afghanistan, the typical age of people that were going over to join the, uh, the so-called jihad, was in between 25 and 35, and no women. This was you know, during Afghanistan uh, versus USSR, and then uh, sort of when we, after 2001, when we uh, decided that we were going to go into, NATO went into Afghanistan. No women. Now, going to Iraq and Syria, the typical age range of people that are going to join ISIL is in between 14 and 25, and in the Western world, in between 10 to 15% of them are young girls and women. Why? A number of reasons. One is that the internet has helped the concept of leaderless jihad. And this is what we talk about, the concepts of the global jihadist insurgency. People talk about lone wolf. I don't like the word lone wolf as well because lone wolf insinuates that you just sat there in a bubble and you've suddenly ended up becoming radicalised. I prefer self-starter because you have to have the contact with somebody. You can't, it's, it's virtually impossible just to sit there wondering, I'm going to be radicalised today. I'm going to become a jihadist. Somebody online or somewhere has to be in contact with you. Give you these ideas, give you these beliefs. The Orlando massacre. At the end of the day, I can't go into it too much, but at the end of the day, one of the key drivers for the guy who carried out the, the number of key drivers. What, what, what. First of all, there's evidence to suggest that he was gay. There's evidence to suggest that he repressed, tried to repress that. There's evidence, I've been very careful what I say. There's evidence to suggest that he had a problem with that. There is clear evidence that there were people that persuaded him that as a Muslim, he can't be gay, he'll be punished. And one of the ways to redeem himself and become a martyr is to go and carry out these acts. There's clear evidence of that. There's a guy, there are... Have you, have you heard of the three girls from London, Bethnal Green, that went out to join ISIL? 16-year-olds. Okay. One of them is a girl called Amira Abbas. She was 15, sorry, she was 15. Where'd she went? Amira Abbas. 
Um, a family, I think, are from Somalian origin. <coughs> Father migrated to, to the UK. She was born here. And after she went, 15, three of them, she went when she was 15. After she went, she, her father was pictured on a BBC website, clutching a teddy bear, crying for his daughter to come back. I believe, genuinely believe, that his tears were real. As a father, I genuinely believe that his tears were real. He went to Keith Vaz, one of our parliamentarians, invited him to the House of Commons to give evidence, and he blamed the police. And the police, you know, in the era of political correctness, not wanting to face a, a libel case, sent a sort of a very carefully worded apology to him. Sorry, we didn't do enough to stop your daughter from going to Iraq and Syria. Four weeks later, two videos emerged. And in those videos, there was him, he was there, and his daughter, Amira Abbasi, who was 13 at the time, at two marches where they were carrying the black flag of ISIL, burning the American flag, and shouting anti-Israel and anti-Semitic comments. He inadvertently had created the whole mm -hmm. lens at home. He didn't tip her over the edge. ISIS did that. People in ISIS recruited her, and, uh, and there's a whole... We go into that another time. But he created the atmosphere. But online, if you're on Twitter, you're on social media, you're on Kick, you're on all these different social media websites, a young girl sitting at home who's being re socially regressed, sorry, a family of politically, socially regressive, don't allow her out because it's cultural. You know, some of it's cultural, some of it does come from some Salafi versions of Islam, but a lot of it is cultural. Don't let the daughter out. Don't let her go out and do all the things that the boys can do. She's sitting at home, she's got another life, she's talking to somebody in Iraq and Syria. It's almost as if she's talking to Baghdadi himself. <coughs> or a representative Baghdadi. It's empowerment, it's emancipation, believe it or not. To go out to all the way to Iraq and Syria for a lot of these young girls and wear the, the burqa, the niqab, and not be allowed out without a, a, a mahram, a person, it's emancipation. It's a cause. That's all get that. It's the idea of a cause. So, online extremism exists, and, and more and more girls, young girls, are getting involved. What's been tried? Negative measures. Well, you know, the British government has had social media companies taking down 1,100 websites and social media accounts down over the last two years, every week. So there's one set up, uh, second another one sets up, straight away. You know, it's just a constant case of taking them down and, 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 and then they pop up. Whoops. <coughs> <coughs> Filtering, hiding, and limitation blocking. But, the problem is, for people, if we just use negative measures, all we're doing is creating this victim mentality amongst people who say, look at us, look at what social media are doing, look what the government's doing. We're actually just trying to portray, all we're doing is portraying what Israel is doing against the Palestinians. All we're saying is what the Americans are doing against this, blah, 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 and they're taking our website down. What they forgot to tell them was, or they don't tell them is, that there was a video also on there that they They don't tell them that. Just, yeah, this is look at our body of our work. This is all we're doing. And it creates this victim mentality, this otherization. So, what should we do? That people are not breaking the law. Well, we need to find counter alternative narratives. And that's why I showed you the video, and we need more of it. The propaganda war is something that's going on. And I think somebody yesterday used the word propaganda. Somebody used the word propaganda. Yeah, of course there's a propaganda war. One of the reports that's not on the reading list, and I did actually send the link, I don't know what I sent it to, uh, there's, there's the, on, on the reading list that I suggested, there's a report on there called The Virtual Caliphate. Do read that, because what that does is uh, it's, it's, it looks at the theory behind the propaganda war that ISIL undertake, but the one that's missing is there's another report called Documenting the Virtual Caliphate. That's the one I really want to read as well. Because what we did was we, for one month, the month of Shaban, <coughs> measured and monitored the official propaganda that ISIL is sending out. And guess what? 
there's some frightening things over there. One is that on average, ISIL produce 38 unique bespoke pieces of propaganda every day. And it's transmedia. What's transmedia? It's not just online, it's radio, it's TV, it's print, it's t-shirts, it's a whole range of different things. This is just their official propaganda coming out of Iraq and Syria. What about the disseminators? We haven't even gone into that. Of course there's a propaganda war going on. When we look at the ISIL videos, sometimes we get a bit derailed about looking look at the production. Uh, we have this conversation this morning, sorry. <laughs> looking at the production value. Looking at all of these things and you know, stepping back and saying, you know what? These guys have taken the production of these videos, to, of jihadist videos, to another level. These are really good questions, but sometimes they take us away from what we should be doing. We can do that. I mentioned that we've, you know, we have companies, we, we now work with MNC Satchi, we now work with Verbalization, we now work with a whole number of PR companies, utilizing the skills that they have in actually helping to counter this propaganda war. Taking the academic uh, research and the dimitude to democracy and the whole range of it, and taking it out to people, because we're going to take it out to people. What better focus than, 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 than online? And we've got, to, we've got to ask better questions. We've got to ask more questions around, you know, what is it and how are they spinning this propaganda? Sometimes it can come across that when somebody is pushing the line against Islamism or against anti-Semitism or against something, you know, whatever, any fascist beliefs, it can sometimes come across as, you know what, propaganda, but guess what, these guys are doing it even better than we are. <coughs> these guys are getting people to kill people off the back of propaganda. So we need more effective responses. You know, we've you know, I mentioned the, the virtual, virtual caliphate. Something else to, 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 to think about as well. In their propaganda, we often think that, you know, their videos and their propaganda is barbaric. That's what we see. Less than 5% of their propaganda is barbaric. The rest of it is focusing on the otherization, the utopianism, it's talking about all the good things, mercy, all these other things come to the land of milk and honey. So it's taking these people who are being radicalised to a certain point and then giving them an out there. Oh, here's a solution. And only less than 5% of their propaganda is barbaric. So why is it effective? Because it's broad. It catches a wide target audience. Why is it also effective? By the way, these slides I'll, I'll, I'll pass on to Charles and you're welcome to, to have these. Why, 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 is it also, why is it also effective? There's about four or five reasons. One is it's anti-establishment. You know, we've got Trump, we've got here in the UK Jeremy Corbyn, we've got in the France probably Marie Le Pen, we've got a whole range of people who are gaining momentum because they're anti-establishment. ISIS, ISIL have recognised that trend and are focusing in on that, honing in on that. They use Islamic motives and they talk about God's law. You know, that there's a great uh, there's, there's an Al Qaeda, uh, sorry, an ISIS magazine, Al Qaeda magazines that have come out. Uh, from, it wasn't David, it was the other one. They came out a couple of days ago. Top five reasons, their words, why they hate the West. Foreign policy is number five. The first one is your infidels. You don't carry out God's laws. You, um, you are, um, what was it, the other one was, you are puppets to the Jews. Foreign policy is number five. Their reason. And I guess they had to put it in there. But it's not really. I don't care. If, 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 we, if it wasn't one thing, it was something else. The global jihadist insurgency has to have something, the oxygen by which it thrives. It's the Islamist ideology, it's the anti Semitic uh, view, world view, and it's all the other things that I talked about. The movement, technology. You know how they do you know, do you know how ISIS are honing in some of their missiles in Iraq and Syria? They're using iPads. iPads and GPS. Linked next to the missiles, I've photographs of them. Linked next to the missiles, da, 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 stepping back, and the missiles are landing where they're supposed to land. But more than that, they're using 
<coughs> internet, social media, kick, all these different telegram, and all these things. Finally, I meant to mention ISIS doesn't radicalize anybody per se. They take uh, they hold in other things. I think I'll stop there and then carry on. Uh, I think in terms of slides, I sort of there's only about another five, five, five or six slides, but we might do that after the break. Yeah, whatever's good for you. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. So we can get the a break, break for tea. Before we break the tea, I want to welcome Dr. David Hirsch from Gold.